Hi, I'm Neil Bonnet. Welcome to the show, and welcome to my home here in Hueytown. I come to the river, the main reason I come is to relax. Don't stop the picture. If there was a Mr. Congeniality in the sport, it was Neil Bonnet. He was polished, and he was caring and sincere. He didn't have to intimidate. He just outdrove you. Neil Bonnet of Hueytown, Alabama, the protege of the great Bobby Allison, has won here. Winning is probably one of the worst things that ever happens to a race car driver. It's the worst and the best thing. Once you start winning, you can't be satisfied with anything less. I put out a winning effort every Sunday, and when I don't win, I'm mad at Neil Bonnet. We're right here in Hueytown, Alabama, where the Alabama gang originated. Directly behind me is Bobby Allison's home. Directly across this hollow, Red Farmer. And I'm the guy that lives right over those trees on the other side of that hill. Neil been with us since he was a kid. But kind of hanging around at Bobby's shop, he's picking up information and learning stuff. You know, he would work during the day, and then he'd come by the shop and, and work at night. Bobby Allison was his mentor, like it was a, a father and son. And Davey was like a little brother. Bobby really opened the door for me. He gave me stuff that made me a winner. Neil Bonnet, driver of the Wood Brothers car, a brilliant, brilliant race. Neil was always running wide open. He was serious about his racing. Now he looks low to the inside. Coming off the corner, Neil Bonnet wins. I think the hardest thing in this sport is not to let losing whip you. 16-time winner, Neil Bonnet wins here today. You know, I've been through some of those 30 race streaks where you don't win, 40 race streaks, but I knew I was going to win again. Neil Bonnet climbing out of the Valvoline Pontiac, and his wife Susan comes in and gets a big hug and a kiss. What are the sacrifices that you had to make to get to where you are now? Family, more so than anything. Neglecting them through the years, not being with them. You know, I'd leave on Tuesday, I'd come home on Monday morning. And the only person that knows how bad I feel is my wife. You have to come to know that people who do this have to have a drive. That drive was there. He always wanted to win a championship, and he just had to go along with it <laughs> or be miserable. Mother was a very selfless person, and I think to be a wife of a NASCAR driver, you have to be selfless because Dad wasn't here all the time. You and Dale learned how to do a lot of hunting together, a lot of fishing together. What are the two of you like out here on a boat? A lot of wheel marks on the boats. <laughs> Neil and Dale were really good friends. Dale, when you got him away from the racetrack where he could relax, he loved to play practical jokes. You better move. I got the idea. And Neil was funny. Feel that power? Yeah. Yeah, it gets my hair standing up on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> he was full of I caught a fish one day, and, and he lips him, you know, he picks him up. Well, it's true. He's too little. My biggest fish I ever caught, bass, you know. Wait a minute. What do you think, man? Pretty good little fish. Yeah. He's one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. And I think I get along with him because he's just like I am. He's just as aggressive. And I, I don't want him, because I fish and hunt with him, to ever give me another inch on the racetrack than he did before. Because I'm certainly not going to give him that inch. Our fans come to see door handle to door handle, fender to fender, beating and banging and pushing and shoving. That's our brand of racing. Trouble up at the turn. Tough hit for Bonnet. Boy, he has taken a lick as the car now comes to rest on the front straightaway of the midpoint of hit road. You know, a head injury, you don't have to hit your head. Your head can move around quickly and it can cause damage. He didn't recognize me. Uh, mother, he called her that woman. I wanted to go down after he came out of the hospital, and Susan said, Dale, don't come. She said, he won't know you. And I, I couldn't grasp it. I said, Neil Bonnet won't know me. I was told the same thing by Susan. Looking back, he hit so hard that there was probably some loss of blood flow to certain parts of the base of the brain, 
and when you lose blood flow to the brain, nowadays we call it a stroke. Without getting into details with the injury, I can't get in that car for a while. It just takes time, and it's hard, particularly someone like him that's so good, so active, and, and to be patient to give it time to heal. Do you want to come back now? I don't know who said it, but evidently they don't realize who they're talking to. <laughs> when he started coming around, then we started, you know, seeing each other a little bit and talking. And when he did start talking, he still wasn't fully put everything in place. But what sort of got him going was looking at a, at a deer that he killed when he was with me. A deer head on the wall that he shot out from under Earnhardt triggered something in his memory. And from that point, he started remembering everything else. Dale came to visit Neil a lot, and he just, he loved that. Happy birthday to you. If it hadn't have been for Dale, I don't really know how he would have gotten through it. He really has an understanding of uh, what Neil's all about. For standing behind him and by him, if, you know, I think if it happened to me, he'd, been, he'd still he'd be that kind of friend to me. What have you been doing to occupy your time since you haven't been driving? The biggest thing I've had to do is stay away from the races. Uh, my son started racing and I'm working with him. But right now, one of the problems that I have is uh, I really get depressed at times. I can go to the racetrack and it just kind of sinks in, hey, I can't get in one of those things. I can't do what I want to do. But I can't stay away from it. I can't go to the track and not do anything. But I might have some other avenues of things that I can do at the track and I'm looking at that. I might find some other things that I can do in Winston Cup racing. Sometimes it's hard to tell if a guy's going to be a winner early on, but sometimes a diamond needs a good scrubbing before it can really, really shine. Well, Winners was a show on the national network, and we were really looking for a race car driver personality instead of just kind of a generic on-air guy, and um, Neil was the obvious choice. So for the first Winners show, the camera crew and I go over to Hueytown and go to Neil's catfish farm. Okay, I'm wrong. You want me to ask him what it takes? To be a winner? Yeah. Aggressiveness, that's what it takes to be a winner. <laughs> and then go to Neil's house to scout out some props for the studio set we thought we were going to do. And we go down to his basement with all the trophies and the full regalia. And I said, well, this is the set of winners. It just said Neil. Folks, step into my laboratory. And so instead of having Neil come to a studio, we went to Hueytown every couple of weeks and did his studio portions. Did I do it wrong? No, Good, because I don't want to do this on any time. Oh, sure you do. It's fun. Hello. Please put flashing when I'm helloing. It's more personal like that. You open your home and people can see that you live just like they do. I think that was just a, a really groundbreaking thing. This is my den, my show. You got my sweaters on and watching my Rex and getting a chuckle out of it. Yeah. Wow. And it was just the perfect combination of the right talent in the right environment with the right subject matter. And everybody adored him. So there was such authenticity to it. That winter show was a slam dunk. They had someone who could tell a story in a very compelling way, make everyone watching at home say, gosh, how do you not like a guy like that? <clears throat> How are you doing? I'm fine. We enjoy you on TV. Well, glad you do. You do a great job. Neil. Thank you. We sure do. We miss you racing, though, too. Yeah, I kind of miss it myself. <laughs> he loved doing the winter show, but his heart was in the race car, and that's where he wanted to be. Knowing that he could hit his head again and something major could happen, that was difficult. But he said, I live right on the edge when you're out there, and I have to do this. All of his buddies, Dale Earnhardt and all those guys, were still running races, and he was sitting there walking up and down the garage area with a microphone. We're in the garage area, and I was sitting there talking to Dale. Neil came walking up, and Neil said, hey, can I talk to you guys for a minute? And Dale had this incredible sense of knowing what someone wanted to ask before they asked it. And Dale said, are you happy? 
And Neil said, no, nah, I'm miserable. And then Dale Earnhardt said, and then get your ass back in the car. Dale said, we got cars, we'll handle that. And Neil said, really, you think so? He said, man, it's your life, and life's about being happy. Yeah, you ready to go test her down there at Talladega? <laughs> and then came Talladega. At approximately 2.15 on Monday afternoon, Davy Allison and Red Farmer left Birmingham, Alabama in a helicopter to pay a surprise visit on friend Neil Bonnet, whose son David was testing a Bush Grand National car at Talladega Super Speedway. Trying to get out of the helicopter, and Neil come running over. And Neil grabbed me by the arms and pulled me out of the rest of the way on the helicopter. And I told Neil, I said, get Davy out. I said, he's hurt. The helpless thing I've ever felt, I couldn't get him out. People say, why do you race for a living? There's a lot of things that can happen any way in life. It's just at times it's pretty trying. I think that the accident caused him to think twice about things. You know, not everything was about him. After the accident, we talked about how senseless and how needless this was and how fragile life really is. And then Neil said, look, Doc, he said, I need you to help me make sure that Susan and Kristen and David know he loved them more than he could ever say. And uh, he told me about a letter he wrote that let them know that he was happy doing what he was doing because he was back in the race car. Neil Bonnet, back at the helm after three years absent. We we're going to be able to talk to Neil during the race. Boy, what a sight. All the people with the Davy Allison banners up. An opportunity for me to get go back racing like this is kind of mixed emotions, but I'm fixed to have a lot of fun. We'll see if we can take the people along for the ride. He was very excited to get back in the car. And I don't think it was a thing of proving anything to anybody. It was just he loved to go and race. There's Neil Bonnet at the black number 31. Now we're looking at his windshield. Caution. We got a major crash to the trial. Okay. I'm thinking, gosh, how much is he going to have left? Wow. OK, maybe this will get it out of his system. He got out with a smile on his face, and he went right up in the booth and finished the broadcast that day. And Neil Bonnet has swapped the race seat for the seat up here again. Boy, am I glad to see you. Yeah, Ken, I tell you what, I want to make sure nobody gave my job away up here. <laughs> <laughs> this may sound silly, but I think that gave him more confidence to do it again. Neil was like reborn. He was at Daytona. He had a five or six race deal that was guaranteed. And Neil said, that's all I need. In a few races, I'll be back to me. And we never got there. I was in the car on the way to Daytona when I got the call. They just told me Neil had had a bad accident. They told me that dad had had a serious wreck at Daytona and that NASCAR was sending a jet. Dad had been involved in several bad accidents before and never had they sent a jet, so I knew. The death of racing legend Neil Bonnet during practice on the track here has stunned and saddened the racing world. That wreck should have never happened. Neil should have never got hurt that day. I stayed pretty mad about that wreck. Maybe I could have prevented it. Maybe I should have said enough's enough. But now I'm in the hospital, and he was gone. We went to the hospital, and Jerry Punch was there waiting on me when I got there. Mom walked out, and she said, 
I need you to open the safe. And I said, what do I need to open the safe for? And she said, your dad's left us something. Previous to his death, Neil had experienced so many things in his life. I think he had had realized that it wasn't just about him. You know, it was about all of us and and the things we'd been through in our life. And I, I just think that he he wanted to clear all that up. I guess. Dad was not a letter writer. I mean, there was no doubt the love between all of us, but he was not your poetry writing, letter writing type person. Susan, if anything should happen to me, I just want you to understand that I had to do this. At times I think I'm going crazy or just can't control what's going on. The only thing that I can say is that I take you for granted. I could not have found anyone like you. <laughs> it was so thoughtful to say the things he said, because I think he felt like we sacrificed for him to live his dream. And I think there was some guilt there that shouldn't have been there because he provided a great life for us. I've heard people say sometimes, good things come from the bad. I'm very ashamed of some of the things I have done in the past, but please forgive me, and I will try to be the type of person you deserve. Love, Neil. I think the greatest thing that Neil ever gave me was that letter. It cost me and our entire family just to get out of our box. We had a life that we lived through him. And I think he made a, the greatest sacrifice without even knowing it to help us see that we were individuals and we had a life and we could move on we could move on i might not say it every day susan kids you're the best and folks i owe you too for the support you've given me in all my careers i'll be the first one to tell you if they let me regroup and go back through there again i'd do it the same way nobody had any more fun than i had doing it <laughs>